Hello, welcome everybody. Okay, so I would like to say welcome again to everybody. I'm here in Manila, Jason is there in Singapore, and I know that we have viewers and participants from all across the world, and it's such a pleasure to welcome everybody here. So just to give you a quick overview of how the program is going to go, we are going to be talking to Jason, of course, uh, about the book and the ins and outs of how it came to be, as well as some themes of the book. But uh, before that, I will be introducing him so that you guys get to know him a bit better. And uh, while I'm doing that and all throughout the show, feel free to start uh, thinking up questions because we're going to have a question and answer portion later. We will make time for that. So make sure to type your questions over at the chat so that we can check it out and uh, uh, choose a couple of questions. Jason, of course, will be reading an excerpt from his novel. And then later, towards the end of uh, the launch, we are going to have a super special prize giveaway. And we'll give you more details about that in a bit as we get to that point. And uh, a lot of other freebies that we are going to be talking about and discounts too. So for now, let me start doing my job and introduce the man of the R. Okay, I'm going to be reading from uh, the book. So Jason Eric Lundberg was born in New York, grew up in North Carolina, and has lived in Singapore since 2007. He is the author and anthologist of over two dozen books, including Most Excellent and Lamentable, Diary of One Who Disappeared, Carol the Coral, Strange Mammals, Embracing the Strange, the Alchemy of Happiness, Fish Eats Lion, Red Dot Ariel, and the six book Bobo and Cha Cha children's picture book series, as well as Best New Singaporean Short Stories, the anthology series. He is also the fiction editor at Epigram Books, where the books that he has edited have won multiple awards and made various year's best lists since 2012, as well as being the founding editor of Lontar, the Journal of Southeast Asian Speculative Fiction. His writing has been anthologized widely, widely shortlisted for multiple awards and honorably mentioned twice in the year's best fantasy and horror and translated into half a dozen languages. This book, A Fickle and Restless Weapon, is his first novel and 25th book. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the man of the hour, Jason Eric Lundberg. Hi, Jason. Hey, everybody. Thank you very, very much for being here tonight, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> What's going to happen now is uh, I'm going to ask you to give us uh, a sample. Read part of the book so that we get a taste of what it's like, so that we will go out and uh, grab a copy as in right now. So go ahead, Jason. Okay. Thank you very much, Dean. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're here to, to moderate this event. You're a good friend and a good person, and I really uh, I'm very honored to be uh, to be talking about the book with you uh, today. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to be reading from the from the book. This is what it looks like: a fickle and restless weapon. And I'm going to read from not from the very very beginning, but from kind of the beginning. So about page 15. Um, so this is the bottom of page 15. So uh, just to kind of keep things a little bit a little bit shorter and not uh, not take too much time with the reading. Uh, but all you need to know, kind of at the beginning of this, is that. Uh, the book takes place in an alternate secondary world version of Singapore. So it's, it's a lot like Singapore culturally, but geographically, historically, it's, it's uh, quite different. Um, but that gives you an idea of kind of where this is uh, taking place. And at the beginning here, uh, we're introduced to one of our three protagonists. Uh, his name is Zed, and he's an artist. He's a, a dramaturge, I guess. He does uh, different kinds of performance art and uh, he's coming home. So he's been away for a number of years. He's been living in the UK and, uh, and performing all over the world. And now he's coming home because of the funeral of his big sister. Um, so that's where I'm gonna start on uh, page 15. So he's, uh, he's been taking a very long uh, train trip uh, from China uh, throughout Southeast Asia down into Tinhao. And uh, so he's finally gotten off the train and now he's taking uh, a subway train, uh, kind of like the MRT here in Singapore, uh, to his mother's flat. 
And uh, this is kind of him, him finally getting on the train, on the subway train to, to make that journey. At Kenaway 4, an extremely pregnant woman boarded with a toddler in tow. Every seat in the train car was taken, and the woman glared around, daring everyone with her gaze. Zed was exhausted, having traveled for the past several days over the vast swaths, swaths of the Chinese mainland, been down through Vietnam, Cambodia, Siam, and Malaya. It would have been financially easy enough to hire a car and driver to bring him the whole way, to arrive in comfort and luxury, but that just wasn't his way. He had at least 15 more minutes on the TMRT, and he didn't want to spend them standing up, but none of his fellow riders were apparently going to give up their seats. So, we finally, so he got to his feet and motioned to the young mother, who smiled genuinely and sat in the proffered indentation in the plastiform bench. After she got situated and heaved her squirming little boy onto her lap, she unleashed an invective in Hokkien at the other passengers, all of whom averted their eyes in shame. Zed couldn't understand the exact words, his Hokkien and Tiu Chu were rusty. He'd always been more proficient in English. But the meaning was clear. He sat on his suitcase and tried to balance amid the subway's vibrations. Zed disembarked at Ilianor II. The northern escalator brought him up to street level, and after waiting for only a few minutes at the streetcar stop, its overhead awning like a turquoise question mark, the vehicle, or, or, the vehicle arrived with a clanging of bells. The streetcar wound through familiar thoroughfares, passing the primary schools, the recreation center, the boarded up workers party headquarters. The smells of his childhood permeated the streetcar, saturating his brain with memory. As the Indian grocer, the Dutch chocolate shop, the British butcher, the Vietnamese cafe, has the independent booksellers, tobacconists, tailors, luggage suppliers, liquor stores, and many, many food courts. He recognized some, the businesses that had managed to hang on despite Tin Hao's relentless march of progress, but the new shops and stalls far outnumbered these, providing a familiar but altered landscape, the past and the present overlaid in his mind's eye, a, dis a distinct disconnect between the two, an unmatched set. At Nagari Ilianor Public Housing Block 137, Zed stepped off the streetcar and approached the looming concrete building, its blueprint ubiquitous all throughout Tin Hao, as though gigantic filing cabinets had been knocked on their sides all over the entire country. In the foyer, sitting behind an enormous plywood desk, was the doorman, feet up, reading the Tin Hao People's News, the government mouthpiece. Zed cleared his throat, and the doorman pulled a corner of the broadsheet down until his left eye came into view. Yeah? Zed relaxed the part of his mind that qualified him as a Swede, and with a practiced mental click, his facial features flowed and reshaped and settled into their most familiar form. The feeling had been highly disconcerting after he'd discovered his ability as a teenager, as though nothing solid of him really existed as if he were made of a slow-moving tar that occasionally allowed itself to stiffen into a given form. But that had been long ago, before he had gained mastery. At the physical change, the doorman jerked his feet off the desk, but to his credit, did not fall over or even yelp in surprise. Swedes were more common every day. There were some experts who proposed that in just one or two more generations, no human being would be born without some kind of special ability. But Zed would have forgiven the doorman for losing his shit, at least a little bit, at seeing a man change his face right in front of him. Zed dug, in his scuffed, sorry, Zed dug his scuffed national identification card out of his pocket and flashed it at the man, who grunted. I know you lot. You staying long? No. The doorman grunted again and motioned to the lift with his head. Okay, you know where, he said, and then went back to his new newspaper. Zed walked to the lift lobby, rolling his suitcase behind him, his head stuffed full of cotton after the long voyage, his arms and legs abruptly heavy. He was so tired. He closed his eyes as the machinery that powered the lift in front of him hummed. Oi, superstar, welcome home! Zed turned around at the doorman's utterance and flinched as the flash from the man's mobile phone temporarily blinded him. A brief surge of anger rose up, daring him to charge back to the desk snatch the man's phone and dash it to pieces on the tiled floor of the lobby. 
or at the very least, throw the man his middle finger. But then, just as suddenly, the feeling dissipated. He'd been photographed so often by so many people over the past several years that he could make no claim to privacy anymore. Still, he'd hoped to be able to avoid the amateur paparazzi for at least a few days until after the memorial service. He sighed. Too much to hope for. The man was already probably uploading the photo to Friendface or Instagram, even as Zed stood there. The door soon parted and he stepped inside. Press the button for seven. The lift hurtled upward and then dinged open at the seventh floor. The corridor was more run down than the last time he'd been here, more dirt and scum on the walls, a darker gray cast to the concrete. In one of the neighboring flats, a Tamil soapy was cranked to full volume and the melodramatic dialogue echoed in the corridor. At the third door on the right, he took a deep breath and knocked. After a few moments, the door opened. A large Pohanarong woman stood there, mop in hand. At over two meters tall, she filled the entire frame and her dark reddish brown skin, coarse all over as if she were an ancient, ancient oak tree come to life, was shiny from work. Her deep green eyes glistened and the corners of her mouth pulled upward slightly, the kind face and the looming presence of his early years. Then a middle-aged Chinese woman in a flower print, flower print dress appeared from behind and elbowed the Poharang maid out of the way. The woman's straight dark hair was cut short in a bob that accentuated her sharp cheekbones and her eyes were rimmed with red, her smile bittersweet. As the maid turned to go back into the flat, the Chinese woman pulled Zed forward into a rib-crushing hug that expelled the air from his lungs. After a long moment, she released him and looked at his face, her eyes blinking quickly. Sayang, Sayang, she said. I thought you coming tomorrow. I was going to ask R to fetch you from the station. Hello, Ma. It's good you come home, Sayang. We can put your sister to rest now. And I'll stop right there. Thank you, Jason. That was great. Oh, man, I am so happy. I'm stoked to be here and to celebrate with you. This is the culmination of how long? How long did it take? Let's get this started. How long did it take you to write this book? Well, to write, the, not as long as it took from, from like conception to publication. So okay. I, actually started, I started working on the book in uh, December 2004. So it's been, it's been about 15 and a half years uh, since then to actually getting it published. So uh, there were some stops and starts along the way. So uh, uh, it took, I did like a year of research just on the world building and kind of putting the world of Tin Hao together because I knew, I knew that I didn't want to just tell this one story. I knew that there was, this was a setting I could tell multiple stories in. Um, and I did that with my novella, uh, Diary of One Who Disappeared, uh, that was published last year. Um, which takes place about, uh, I think it's about 25 years after uh, Figgle and Restless Weapon. So, so I knew that I had a big setting. I knew that I had something that I could spend a lot of time in. And, um, and there's the map. There's actually the map of Tin Hao that I had to come up with the geography. And, uh, and you can even see the, the train lines that kind of go through there. And the, the wow. Uh, and this was uh, really wonderfully rendered. I did it. I did a, a hand drawing of this. And this was re very wonderfully rendered by... Uh, one of the designers um, at Epigram Books, uh, JL. So she did a great job with that. So, so it took me a, a, a while just to kind of put the world together. Um, and then it was kind of, you know, writing it off and on for about six, seven, eight years. Uh, there was a big chunk of that time where I was teaching full time and I couldn't devote the time that I wanted to it. So it took a while to actually get it in the shape that I wanted to. And I did get stuck actually at one point. I got stuck about 30,000 words in. And I just didn't know what, what was going to happen next. And um, my characters were fighting me. And so I had to really kind of internally have a discussion with them. I was like, guys, what's your problem? Why can't I get going with this? And, um, and it took a while to, to digest that and to process that until I realized that I had to make some fundamental character changes um, before the rest of the story could continue. Uh, and once I did that, it kind of flowed uh, out of me after that. So... So the final, uh, I finally finished writing like the first draft of it in 2012. And that's when, like shortly after that, that's when I uh, showed it to you as one of my first readers. Yes. Uh, that was eight years ago, man. And I no. remember <laughs> reading it and uh, 
I was floored. I was floored by the writing, by the, by the world building. And you are one of the few authors that I know who are able to create such an intricate setting. It is so mesmerizing and immersive. And I love going there. So I'm happy that there was a diary and I'm happier that we have this full length book. Your process, all authorial processes are, are very interesting to me and I'm sure to your readers and, and our viewers. So how important is world building to you? Uh, I mean, it, it depends on the story, but for, for this, for this novel, it was very important because huh. I was trying to tell a story that um, I had, at that point when I started it, that was, that was 2004, so I had visited Singapore already, but, uh, but I hadn't moved here yet. And so, uh, so I had visited, I think, uh, it, once, maybe twice at that point. And really, I really fell in love with Singapore. I really enjoyed the culture and the people here. And, um, and it was really, it, it seemed like it was someplace that was ripe for story. But I didn't want to necessarily write a, a story about Singapore because at that point, I didn't really feel like, for one thing, I didn't feel like I had the right to do that. Mm. It was like, who is this, this, you know, kind of foreigner, this Angmo coming in, you know, writing about Singapore. So so I didn't feel like I had the right to do that. And I also didn't want to be necessarily uh, constricted by, uh, by Singapore's history and by, um, by the politics here and that kind of thing either. So I wanted to be able to kind of open things up a little bit more. And so that's why I decided to create a more fictional version of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, even in short stories, it's, it's important at least to have it kind of in the back of your head. Uh, you might not be telling like a completely secondary world story. It could be very much in the present day, but there still has to be some bit of that in terms of the world building that has to be in your head. So you kind of know, you know the environment that your characters belong in. No, because my hat's off to you, my friend, because you manage a, a wonderful trifecta. You have a setting that feels lived in. It feels authentic, even if it's speculative. And there are so many little details, uh, even in... Uh, the way you you, you describe uh, you thrill the senses you 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 describe smell scents uh, sound music uh, as well as all the visuals and uh, it's like I'm I'm walking there and the second part of the trifecta is your character work so you decided to have three main characters hmm. uh, we have Zed we have Tara and my favorite Vai he's he's, he's yeah. okay. You're did pretty you, awesome. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> did you always have three in mind? I did. Yeah. Kind of. Even at the beginning, I knew that. I knew that the first character to come in mind was Zed, and so I, I knew that it was going to be partially his story. Um, and then, kind of as I was working through it, the other two kind of came to me because Zed and Vahid are artistic partners, and so they they work uh, creatively together. And um, I there were there were like a number of kind of permutations of kind of figuring out who I wanted to be uh, like the point of view characters, but it, they very quickly kind of rose to the top. So I was trying to think about other people that I might be telling their stories uh, from their point of view in the book, but Mr. Han, were, huh? Mr. Han, <laughs> Mr. Han was very, and there's, I think there's at least one more short story. In, that yeah. I mind, so yeah. So he's, we see Mr. Han a little bit later uh, in the book and he's a, yeah. he's a character. He's a very interesting guy. And, we do get a little bit of his backstory uh, kind of toward the middle of the book. There's a very kind of um, eventful thing that happens in the middle of the book. And he is kind of right in the middle of it with, along with his friends. So you get a bit of his backstory and kind of where he, how he got to where he is. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's probably at least one more story that's going to uh, star him. <laughs> oh, yes. And we're looking forward to that. Wait, I want to remind all our viewers and, and uh, guests here you should start thinking of questions for Jason and uh, type them in on chat, okay? Then we'll get to that in a bit. So Jason, let's take a step back and go back to your writerly process. Um, when you are writing, is there any particular kind of uh, environment that you need or prefer? Like, does it need to be quiet? Do you need, can you write in a crowded place or something like that? Do you need to be focused or what? I think that I can, it's, it's a very cliche thing, but I used to, I used to write a lot in cafes. <laughs> so, oh. Unfortunately, I kind of fell, fall into that cliche a bit, but, um, but I those. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't been able to do that 
obviously a, a lot lately just because of the pandemic. So, um, so, and that's, I haven't been able to write much at all, um, during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just cause of the mental kind of energy to just to kind of deal yeah. with what we're in right now. Um, but the way it used to be was that, yeah, I would love to write in cafes. There was one cafe in particular that I, that was kind of like a second home. Um, and I could just park myself there for like hours and hours and, and you know, work on my With, with just one coffee or one drink. Sometimes I would, I would usually be nicer than that. I would usually, usually get like a slice of cake or something just to, if I was there for four hours. It oh would my be, gosh. Yeah. I would need to Beaching get something. their electricity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, but what I would do is that I would, I would, uh, I would always bring headphones with me. So, uh, so even if there's a lot of people around and I actually, I actually kind of enjoyed that energy of having other people around, um, but not having to focus on kind of what they're talking about or what they're doing. So I could, put on my headphones. yeah, I had like noise canceling headphones and I would listen to, uh, I'm, I listen to nine inch nails a lot. They're my, that's my favorite band. Uh, what right, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially like some of like Trent Reznor's um, instrumental work that tends to be a bit more atmospheric and, and uh, uh, melodious. Uh, you know, yes. that, I would do that a lot. But I think just because I've listened to so much Nine Inch Nails music over the years that it kind of, when I'm listening to it, it kind of washes over me. I don't pay as much attention to the lyrics and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I would listen to music or, or sometimes I would just have nothing. I would just have the headphones on. But just that enough would be able to, to kind of get me in that space. Um, and yeah, I would, I would take my laptop and go to, to go to a cafe and do that. And just so, write. Then you'd be yeah. able to write. Oh, that's, yeah. that's great. Unfortunately, I can't. It's, it's harder for, I can do it at home, but it's a lot harder. I'm sure you know this. It's a lot harder just because there's so many distractions yeah. and so many things kind of demanding your attention, even if they're not active distractions. But it's like, oh God, I haven't washed clothes yet this week and you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, that I don't feed my daughter. Well, that's that's a bit more active. So, <laughs> yeah. Hey, you so. seem to be a very self-aware writer, uh, but I need to ask: just how self-aware are you, Jason Eric Lundberg? Do you are you aware of any writing quirk or crutch that you might have? Is there like a turn of phrase that you will constantly return to, and you need to police yourself, or maybe maybe a word? that you find yourself using more, more consistently than others. Yeah. It's, it's something where I, and I think a lot of writers have this where you have, um, favorite, it, it, the very broadest, you have favorite themes that you come back to kind of yeah. again, again and again. Um, but yeah, it does seem to be a writerly tick that, uh, I've seen this with other writers too, like, like Neil Gaiman. He's one of my favorite writers. Um, in, in a number of, uh, pieces of, of his fiction, he's got the phrase, uh, a patch of night. So like a cat as black as a patch of night. So, <laughs> so you see that um, in a few of his, in a few of his books and short stories and things. So, um, and one of the things that, and this was actually pointed out in a review of one of my books a few years ago, um, but there's a, there's a word that I really like. It's called apotheosis. Apotheosis? Yeah. Apotheosis, yeah. So it's... it's uh, the culmination of something, the climax. That right, right. Okay. So... I, uh, there was a book that I had, uh, one of my, actually my third collection, uh, Strange Mammals, um, that came out several years ago. There was a review that kind of harped on that because I didn't realize, because it was kind of a kitchen sink review, uh, or a kitchen sink collection of lots of different stories from a, a, like a wide range of time. And I had apparently used that, that word several times in there. And then, um, kind of as I was, and this kind of actually happened after the book was published, but then I went back, I was like, you know what, I, I was using that, that word a lot before. Um, and I checked to see in the novel, and it's actually in the novel three times. So. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So it happens, I guess. <laughs> you wrote this novel over the span of over a decade. You must have had already some idea of the big themes that you were going to tackle. But things change, right? Times change, and sometimes when you, when you let something <clears throat> uh, set and settle for a while, some themes become less relevant. And yet, when I reread it again, uh, I'm struck by how timely, how timely certain themes are. Yeah. Uh, did, did, did you do any specific reworking towards publication to, to rewrite certain things, or was that always there? 
I think it was mostly always there. It was there were um, um, my editor, Eldis Tran, uh, kind of at the at the end when we were when we were actually going through the editorial process. Um, was she was very helpful in, in kind of helping to to shape it and clean things up uh, for publication. Um, but there were kind of those big things were already there. The the big themes that I was really interested in because I initially started this in like I said in two thousand four. Um, that's when George W. Bush was president. And there were a lot of things going on then that have come back around now. Um, so like specifically the, the worry about surveillance and um, that's, that was a big one, but kind of an identity as well. Yeah. Uh, so these were, these were things that I was already thinking about during that time. And uh, it, it became a little bit less relevant, I guess, during the, the Obama years, but now it's back again. And so it seems like it seems very much like I did that on purpose, but it was one of those things where these these kind of the, the times the times change, but they also stay the same. Yes, because uh, especially here in, in my country, uh, there is an anti-terrorism law. So so reading something like this, it feels so so timely, mm. and it feels so relevant. Yeah. So you you have managed uh, with your setting and your characters of course your plot that's the main trifecta with your themes here you tackled so many and i am so excited for your readers because they're going to see how you tackle identity and wow how you tackled it there's there's something i don't want to spoil it but we know that in the second half there is a rather startling woo okay that yeah. that happens so I honestly want to talk about that, but we can't. Yeah. Here, right? yeah I don't want to spoil things for people. Spoil, it, right? a, it is a quite a big character turn. And yeah. I have to say that was always going to happen. That was going to happen okay. from the beginning. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So I know that, that identity, uh, especially identity politics, have become very, very much in kind of the public um, uh not just consciousness, but it's become it's become at the forefront of public consciousness for a lot yes. of people in the last the last five ten years, and so um, it was something that I was always uh, I was already thinking about uh, at that point. Um, so yeah, so it's and it's difficult. Yeah, you're, you're right. It's difficult to kind of talk about this in the in the vague general sense, but yeah. No, but but there are other themes also that uh, your readers are going to take delight in uh, the struggle of artistic expression. Mm. and uh, being true to yourself and what is commercial and how do you support yourself and what is necessary. Uh, the, the, the nature of love and friendship and loyalty, what it means to be a good citizen, what it means to be true to yourself, to your nature, uh, even thoughts about uh, philosophy. Okay, I, I love that there is this uh, uh, current uh, of, of Buddhism and that is uh, part of your practice. It is, yeah. I'm. I'm not. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as as good at, at my Buddhist practice as I probably should be. Um, but I am a practicing Buddhist, and so I do. Uh, I do take a lot of that uh, that philosophy to heart. And uh, and you're right. It does inform a lot of, especially yeah. one character, Tara, in particular. Um, uh, informs her character. Informs kind of how she sees the world and how she interacts with the world as well. Uh, but it's something that is kind of a through line throughout the book, um, and uh, just kind of how how we treat each other as as human beings and the consequences of what we do. It's not just immediate; it can last. You know, as if you believe in karma, it can last for lifetimes. And so there's there's a lot of that that I wanted to to I wanted to include it in the book, but I didn't want to be you know hit you over the head didactic with it either. No, you managed it. You managed it because. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of thought, uh, and sometimes they do well, and uh, it's it's clear. And then you have your characters, and they're not just mouthpieces for the author, for you, but it emanates from them, and that is what makes it such a good read. And I'm so proud of you. I honestly am. And <laughs> thank you, Bellus. Damn it, I am. <laughs> well, because damn you, it's beautiful. I hate you. <laughs> so. Um, we are going to be wrapping up our conversation. I wish we, we could talk more, but I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you, what is your favorite uh, 
part of Tin Hao to write, or who is your favorite character? Oh, that's a really hard one, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned Vahid. He's he is he was probably the most fun to write. I have to say, oh. um, all of all of the main characters they they are, as with all authors, all the main characters they they are parts of me. So there's a bit of me in all of them, but. Uh, but he was just because he's so snarky and he just often just he just doesn't give a shit what other people think and so I love him <laughs> yeah he, he does his own thing I also like uh, there's a character in there named Scarlet uh, who I'm yeah. also very fond of because she's very no nonsense and and uh, very pragmatic and very practical and so uh, so I really enjoyed writing writing them I enjoyed writing all my characters but uh, but they were very fun yeah okay now we're going to take some questions from our uh, guests, okay? Are you ready? I hope so. <laughs> okay. We have a question from our good friend, Terry Windling. Yay, Terry. Okay, I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna read it, Jason, so get All ready. Right. Okay. Terry asks, when a novel is created over many years, the writer who began it is not quite the same person as the writer who finished it. Were there times when those two selves had conflicting ideas about elements of plot, character, etc.? I'm asking because I'm working on a novel that has also taken many years to finish. Mm, uh, first of all, Terry, thank you very much for that question. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to your, your new book as well, um, because I love your writing too. Uh, it's an excellent question. It is, uh, there were things about the book that I was, I was actually worried about this more when we were editing, because as you say, this was, I started this in 2004. I'm a different person now and I have different concerns and, um, it's it's uh it's just a very different world than when I first started it, and so it was a concern when we were editing that uh, that it would be it wasn't quite me anymore. But then I kind of as I was reading it through again because uh, I hadn't I hadn't done that in a while prior to actually selling the book, uh, so I had had multiple multiple drafts of the book. The the one that ended up being published is the eighth draft, but. That seventh draft, in between the seventh and eighth draft, there was quite a big gap. And so I hadn't read it through in a while. And I found that I actually, uh, as I was reading it that, that time uh, when we were uh, going through the editorial process, that uh, I was like, hey, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is you know not too far from, from what I might write now. And there were things in there that actually I... Uh, I was kind of surprised at myself for, for writing. There were some a few turns of phrase that were that were quite nice. I was like, oh man, I wrote that. Um, so it's, uh, in, in a way, yes, I am, I am a different person than the one who actually wrote the book, but I think fundamentally because, because it has, the story itself has had such a strong hold on my brain for so many years, um, I, I think that I was still able to reconcile those different parts of me while, while working on it. Yeah. I know how you feel. I have another question. This is from Jay Chia. Where or how did you gather ideas for this book? Um, a, a big part of it was was you know visiting. Like I said, I uh, I, I was inspired kind of by Singapore uh, when I visited here for the first time before moving here, and that was a big part of it. It was uh, kind of being here. There were a few other things that inspired it as well. Um, just like I said, there was uh, kind of my concerns about surveillance during the, the Bush administration years and uh, this kind of erosion of public trust in institutions that should be taking care of them and, um, and a lot of things, that corruption and all, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's kind of just a lot of things that end up in a big soup kind of in, in your brain that, that <coughs> excuse me, that after a while you, you and again, those like, it, like it, it took me so long to write it because there were more things that came into that soup that were added to the soup as I went along. So uh, it was just kind of an accretion of things that I was thinking about during that time and as I was working on it as well. Okay, we have a question from E.P. Chiu. What draws you to speculative fiction? Is it the fun world building or the science and fantasy elements? or the possibility for transgression or to take on political topics without being overtly political? Or is it because of poetic influence? For example, Neil Gaiman? Why spec fic, Jason? 
Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a genre that I've always loved and uh, kind of over the years as well. It just has always, it's always just struck me how weird the world is. <laughs> the world is just strange. It's, it's a, just a very strange place that we're, that we're all existing in, especially now. Um, and I, I enjoy that strangeness. I enjoy kind of um, uh, pushing that uh, in, in my own writing and also reading about it in other people's writing. And, um, kind of, I don't, I don't know if it was necessarily this at the beginning when I was first drawn to it, but it is now, uh, is this idea that there is not just one narrative, that there are many narratives, there are many ways of looking at the world and it's not just one, uh, one kind of authoritative way of looking at things. And so I think, Fiction in general does this really well, but I think speculative fiction especially uh, is able to kind of get us outside of our own mind and um, and jar us a little bit and go, wait a minute, this thing that I've always kind of taken for granted, it's really not something that is uh, going to exist or, or has existed for all time. So just the idea of money as this kind of this concept that we all, as just as an example, as this concept we all agree on, uh, we take it for granted as a society that that this piece of paper has this amount of value in it um, And that's just weird. That's just very very odd <laughs> That we can all agree that this this you know piece of paper is two dollars um, And it's it's worth you know this this good that I want to buy so uh, So there are there are things that this speculative fiction does I think better than other genres that help you to kind of come at the world in a more slant way That I really enjoy I see some echoes of influence of authors in your writing, but you have already grown beyond that and you have slain your fathers. Let me tell you. Because, and I told you this earlier when I, I, I wrote you way back in 2012, I had not read anything like this. Mm. But who would you say are your three biggest influences? Oh man, that, that changed just me. Today. Just yeah, I know, you gotta narrow it down to three. That just that's really puts me in a Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> just three. We don't have time. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the kind of question where I could give you a list of like twenty five, fifty, I know, hundred people. So, I know. Um, but as you mentioned before, kind of in uh, in Elaine's question there, uh, Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman is up there. He's definitely up there. Um, just in terms of, I've been a fan of his for a long time, and um, and been influenced by him for a long time. Not just in uh, in his writing, but just in his, in his, the way that he presents himself as an author as well, and his generosity to the people around him. Um, even once he became like a superstar, he was still very generous with his time. Um, and it's something that I've always taken to heart. And so, so he's definitely up there, um, just in terms of, in terms of a lot of things, he's definitely up there. Um, another writer that I really enjoy is uh, Jonathan Carroll. Uh, who is an American mm -hmm. author who lives in, I think he's in Vienna. Um, and he's also, he also does this same type of speculative writing where it's, it's very much kind of of the world, but then weird stuff just happens. Yeah. Um, and he has just a wonderful style that I really enjoy too. Um, so so Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman, Jonathan Carroll, and then my third one I have to say, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to agree with this, is uh, Kelly Link. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> yeah, she's she's by far she's my favorite short story writer. Wow. Ever, um, and she's probably my top three in in uh, in in just uh, the writers that I enjoy and are influenced by as well. So she um, she's she's not, not not that much older than me, but she's had a very very productive uh, writing career and a very uh, deep writing career as well. She the way that she she hasn't uh, written a novel yet. Uh, she's written some novellas, but she hasn't written a novel yet. But the way that she uh, thinks in her stories and the way she considers things in her stories uh, is very influential to me. It's very, I, I just, I really enjoy the way that she writes and kind of the way that she thinks as well. Yes, her, her stories are so thoughtful and they're so instructive because it's a narrative that suddenly is different and it just is surprising and amazing. So I agree. I agree with that. I have another question from, from EP. He has a follow-up. What does Tin Hao mean to you? And how did you coin this name? Mm. Um, I think as far as what Tin Hao means to me, I'm not sure I can even answer that question. <laughs> um, 
just because it is kind of all encompassing right now in terms of my my literary output. I'm also uh, writing a I'm writing a new novel right now. Or am I working on it anyway? That also takes place in Tin Hao. It's the, Wait, the is my it, first one. Is it the sequel? Is it? It's, it's going to be the sequel to Diary of One Who Just The Diary. Tin Hao. Yeah. But what so, about to fickle? Well, there's going to be because there's a 25 year gap in there, and so okay. I'm going to have to address it at some point. But but that's in 2035. Huh? 2035. 15 years from now, Jason. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to um, the Tin Hao. Yeah. So, but the way that I the way that I named Tin Hao was I was looking at I, I again Sing Singapore has a very <coughs> there is a very um, a very interesting and a very culturally uh, relevant reason why Singapore is the name of, of, of this country. And so I had to think about if I'm not going to call it Singapore, if it's going to be someplace else, uh, what would be uh, something, something else that I could call it. And so, uh, so I was looking at specifically uh, uh, seafaring culture kind of in the, in the 1800s and the 1900s and, uh, and trying to think about the people who might have come to Tin Hao originally. Uh, and so uh, along with that uh, research, I came across uh, Matsu, uh, who is a sea goddess. Um, I, think, I think Matsu is uh, Japanese maybe, um, but then she also has the name Tin Hao, uh, which I believe is Cantonese. I think I was, I was told by, that, by a friend of mine, I think it's Cantonese. That's right, she's in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. So, There's an apple um, there in the street. <laughs> so uh, and there are bits of bits of Hong Kong that kind of influenced Tin Hao as well. So uh, so it was mostly that it was kind of thinking about you know who would sailors have been praying to you know it, that that operated around you know the waters of Tin Hao uh, and that kind of thing. And so that's that's what got me to to the name. Okay, so we are now going to transition into our generous phase. Okay, and we have a very special uh, prize giveaway. Jason, what are we giving away? Well, do we want to do the prize giveaway or the, the Q&A first? Well, we've been doing the Q&A, Jason. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange that you're, any more you're questions. asking all the questions It made me forget about that. You're right, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. So what are we giving away? Okay, so we have a special giveaway from Epigram Books. It's actually my my three most recent books. So, wow. so The Pickle and Restless Muffin, which we're talking about today uh, as the novel. And then we've also got um, these two books. So Diary of One Who Disappeared is the novella that came out last year that also takes place in Tin Hao. It takes place uh, 25 years after A Pickle and Restless Weapon. And then my uh, selected stories, kind of my best of short story collection, uh, Most Excellent and Lamentable, which also came out last year. So those are the three books that we're gonna kind of give away as a set this evening to, to a lucky winner. Okay, so a lucky winner is going to get all three books, right? That's right. So we are not going to make it easy for them. We're going to see, Jason, if they paid attention, okay? Is that okay with you? That's fine with me. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question of the audience and uh, the first person who can type in chat the answer is going to be the lucky winner. And I, I just want to jump in and say oh. that this is, this is all the people that are in uh, Zoom, in the Zoom. So oh, yes. this is being a, a, a live stream to Facebook Live, but it's only the people who are on Zoom that are going to be uh, eligible for this giveaway. Okay. But we have another one, right, that is open to more people, right? Uh, no, it's just the one. Oh, just this. Okay. Just the one. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, we have been talking a lot about your process and how things came to be. So I'm thinking, and I, I'll see if you agree, that uh, a good question to ask to see if people have been paying attention to both of us as, as we talk is, what is your writing quirk? Do you remember I asked you that, Jason? Yeah, and I think we want to find out a very specific word that I yes. did use. So I asked Jason what his writing quirk was, and he responded with a certain word that appeared in his previous short story collections as well as three times in this novel. If you know what that word is, type it in. Type it in right now. And the first person who gets it right 
we'll get this uh, trifecta, this triumvirate of beautiful books, all with wonderful covers. Jason, who designed the cover for Fickle and Restless Weapon? Uh, well, for the for that book, it was for um, it was all three of them were were designed by uh, by Epigram Books uh, designers, our in house designers, um, and the one who did a Fickle and Restless Weapon, uh, her name is. Um, Oh God, I'm going to forget her name. <laughs> you put me on the spot. Okay, um, okay. Priscilla. So it's Priscilla. I think she goes by Priscilla Yamaguchi online. So, um, but she is, uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful designer. And uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's gorgeous. It's eye-catching. And we both know that uh, sadly people do form judgments of books by the cover and it helps sell it. That's true. It's, and I'm very, I'm very lucky that... Um, that I'm, I'm happy just you know being a being an employee of Epigram Books um, as an editor, but I'm very lucky as an author that I get to benefit from the wonderful designers that we have there because we have uh, such a strong design sense uh, for our books. They're beautiful and the content is beautiful. Okay, so we asked a question and we we challenged our listeners and viewers, and uh, the person who is going to win copies of a fickle and restless weapon. Diary of One Who Disappeared, and Most Excellent and Lamentable by the Man of the Art, Jason Eric Lundberg, is... Let me take a look at the chat and double check. Jason, do you see the name? I do, yeah. Yeah? Say it, Jason. Hey. Who's yeah. our winner? Yeah, Terry Windling. Yay, Terry. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Well, and congratulations. Wow. Okay. So congratulations to, to Terry Windling for, for uh, remembering that word. Okay. I have to tell you, while it is your crutch, I've never used that word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. I, I'm going to start in, in honor of you. Okay. So that you don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> All right. We, we have another offer, Jason. Can you tell us about this book plates? You, you signed a number of book plates, right? Yeah, so I have um, I have a, a deal going on right now uh, for Instagram. So if you uh, have a copy of A Fickle and a Restless Weapon, whether you already have a copy or if you buy one um, now, um, I have an offer going where if you post a selfie of yourself with the book and uh, and tag me in it. So my, my Instagram handle is wombatfishbone, all one word. I know it's really weird. But Again, Wombat please. Fishbone. Again, please, Jason. It's Wombat Fishbone. So like, I should have had like a sign or something. Wombat Fishbone. Okay. Yeah, so Wombat Fishbone. So if you tag me in that with Wombat Fishbone, uh, the first 15 people to do so, I will uh, send a signed book plate and you can put it in your book. Wow. From, from anywhere I am? Yeah, from anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Even Tin Hao? <laughs> well, they're not in our world, Dean, so probably not there. <laughs> okay, so, so let's repeat that. Uh, if you have a copy of A Fickle and Restless Weapon already and you take a selfie with it or take a picture of it and tag Jason at Wombat Fishbone. That's right. And you are one of the first 15, he is going to send you a signed book plate. So... This is fantastic, and that's rather generous of you, Jason. Thank you. As, as a reader, I know I get excited about all of that. I want to say thank you, my friend, for inviting me to, to be here with you and to help celebrate this. I am beyond happy for you because it's like I'm launching my book too. And especially during this time, just to be able to, to do this is, is wonderful. I, I am I'm very pleased, and I'm sure you are too. And I would like to thank uh, the people behind the, the, this production for inviting me as well. So I'm going to say goodbye now, and uh, it has been my pleasure, and I'm going to turn over to Chris. If everybody can just turn on all your cams, including you and uh, Jason and Dean, um, we just want to get a, a, a nice uh, group photo with everybody. Thank you very much for coming down and we hope you have a good evening and the rest of the weekend.